Hello all, welcome back to ATM5, our changing atmosphere. In today's lecture, we're continuing to talk about water in the atmosphere. Specifically, we'll be applying the concepts from last time to understand the formation of clouds and precipitation. In today's lecture, we'll be defining lifting condensation level, and we'll be answering these questions. How does water vapor vary throughout the atmosphere? How do clouds form? How does precipitation form? And how will climate change impact clouds and precipitation? Let's begin by discussing where atmospheric water can be found. In last lecture, we learned that water, warmer air can hold more water vapor. Consequently, it is no surprise that the amount of water vapor in the air follows a roughly analogous pattern to global near surface temperatures. More water vapor can be found around the equator and less around the poles. Water vapor can also be found preferentially over the oceans, as the ocean surface provides a ready source of water. In regions of upwelling, where colder ocean waters come from deeper in the ocean, such as off the west coast of the major continents, there is less evaporation and so less water vapor in the air. Over land, water vapor is largely driven by atmospheric dynamics, as water is carried onshore by weather systems. Looking at this cross-section of the atmosphere, with latitude along the x-axis and altitude along the y-axis, we again see that water vapor closely follows with temperature. At higher latitudes where temperatures are colder, water vapor drops off to nearly zero. Similarly, at higher altitudes away from the equator, there is very little water in the atmosphere. Only in the tropical middle troposphere is water vapor not negligibly low. That is because convection in this region pushes moisture to higher altitudes. Relative humidity, which depends on both water vapor content and temperature, exhibits a far different pattern. We see very high relative humidity near the equator and the poles, even though these areas are starkly different when it comes to the amount of water vapor. Moisture in the middle to upper troposphere is indicative of rising motion, where convection pushes moisture near surface air to higher altitudes where it cools to near saturation. On the other hand, two lobes of low relative humidity at 25 degrees north and south are associated with the subtropical zones, where we find sinking air and suppressed convection. In these regions, the air tends to be very dry in the middle troposphere, although it still is quite moist near the surface. This is again due to the lack of rising motion in these regions. Here we see a cross-section of relative humidity along the surface, again showing peaks around the equator and poles. In fact, the polar regions have quite high relative humidity, driven up by their low temperatures. The relative humidity at the surface actually shows a complex pattern of variation, not entirely related to temperature. The relative humidity at each latitude depends on the amount of ocean at that latitude, and whether air tends to rise or sink. Recall that dew point temperature is a measure of the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. When dew point temperature is low, that implies that there is not a lot of water in the atmosphere, and so temperatures must get low for condensation to occur. When dew point temperature is high, there is more water in the atmosphere, as condensation can also occur at higher temperatures. Dew point temperature differs greatly from winter to summer. Summertime is generally more humid, and so the dew point is higher. However, dew point temperature also varies quite significantly between dry and moist regions. Consider, for example, in the continental US, July temperatures are relatively uniform across the country, as shown in the bottom plot here, except in the mountainous regions and deserts. However, dew point temperatures show a clear east-west divide. This is because the western U.S. tends to be much drier than the eastern U.S., so dew point temperatures tend to be lower. Washington, D.C. and Reno, Nevada are both at approximately the same latitude, but have very different dew point temperatures. These conditions are due to the dominant weather patterns that bring moisture to both regions. In the U.S. West, cooler air from the Pacific carries much less moisture, moisture with it than the warm air from the Gulf of Mexico. This is a simple consequence of warm air holding more moisture than cooler air. Further, air that passes through California and over the Sierra Nevadas precipitates in these montane regions, with dry air descending along the leeward flank of the mountains and into Nevada. As a consequence, Nevada is hot and dry, with high temperatures, low dew point, and low relative humidity. On the other hand, the eastern U.S. receives its air from the south, where moisture is plentiful. And so the eastern U.S. is hot and humid with high temperatures, high dew point, and high relative humidity. 
Over North America, the plot at the left here shows average hourly relative humidity, and the plot at the right shows dew point temperature. Observe that relative humidity is particularly low in the U.S. Southwest, where dew point is similarly low. On the other hand, the U.S. Southeast is hot and moist, leading to high relative humidity and dew point. As we move farther north, the air's water vapor content and temperature both drop off. Relative humidity, which is a fraction consisting of a numerator proportional to water vapor content and a denominator proportional to temperature, stays roughly constant. However, dew point temperature, which is only dependent on the amount of water vapor in the air, drops off quickly. All right, now that we've discussed how moisture varies in the atmosphere, let's turn our attention to discussing clouds and precipitation. There are many different types of clouds, each dependent on the local meteorological conditions, water vapor content of the air, and local temperature structure. Low-level clouds such as near-surface fog include stratus, stratocumulus, and nimbostratus. Mid-level clouds include altocumulus and altostratus. High-level clouds include cirrocumulus, cirrostratus, and cirrus clouds. Convecting clouds are a major focus of this lecture and include both shallow convective clouds, such as cumulus clouds, and deep convective clouds, such as towering cumulonimbus clouds. You're probably familiar with cumulus humilis clouds, which are a common sight in the mid-latitudes, and are driven by local vertical motion and turbulence. However, these clouds usually don't support sufficient vertical motion to drive the formation of raindrops, which are necessary for precipitation. Deep convective towers like this cumulonimbus calvus over the Gulf of Mexico are associated with deep vertical motion reaching through the troposphere. In this case, the strong vertical motion driving convection in this tower produces clear precipitation beneath. Here is a view of these cumulonimbus towers from above. Cumulonimbus clouds that rise all the way to the tropopause take on a characteristic anvil-like shape. This is because convective plumes cannot reach into the stratosphere. So air that rises in these convective towers hits the tropopause and spreads laterally. Clouds, especially deep clouds, have complex vertical structures, often consisting of water in different phases. Near the surface, temperatures are generally warm enough to support liquid water. However, as we go higher in altitude, the temperature drops, leading to a region of mixed ice and water, and a region of pure ice above. Cloud systems consist of many convective plumes and regions of subsiding and sinking air. Because of this complicated structure, precipitation similarly has a complex structure. This is why it can be precipitating in one spot and dry only a few miles away. As mentioned in the last lecture, clouds form as rising air expands and cools. When the specific humidity of the air hits the saturation specific humidity, or equivalently, when the temperature reaches the dew point temperature, or 100% relative humidity, condensation will occur. Water vapor will condense to form liquid water in the form of cloud droplets, small particles of water wrapped around cloud condensation nuclei. The altitude at which this occurs is referred to as the lifting condensation level. Because temperature and moisture content tend to be fairly uniform horizontally, most clouds tend to be pretty flat on the bottom. When cloud droplets grow into rain droplets, snow, or ice, they can precipitate out and fall to the ground. Again, many different kinds of precipitation are possible depending on the local temperature structure, moisture content, and strength of the vertical motion. Here we see a picture of several kinds of precipitation, including hail, grapple, sleet, and snow. Precipitation forms through a multi-step process. First, we need a cloud to be present since those cloud droplets are the precursors to precipitation droplets. For a cloud to be present, we must have air that has reached saturation through lifting. Once this occurs, condensation will drive the formation of small drops or crystals on condensation nuclei. These drops and crystals then grow by molecular motions, pulling them in moisture from the surrounding environment. Under certain conditions, such as with altocumulus clouds, pure liquid cloud droplets may be present at temperatures well below freezing. Under certain circumstances, these cloud drops will rapidly freeze. Once droplets or crystals have formed throughout the cloud, they can then grow through mergers or collisions with other droplets or crystals. Then, once they become large enough, they can no longer be kept aloft by the turbulent motions inside the cloud and will precipitate out to the ground. In the remaining slides, we'll consider these steps in detail. 
First, for clouds to form, there must be a mechanism to lift air. In the process of being lifted, the air will cool, driving the system towards saturation. Generally in the troposphere, each kilometer of altitude represents a drop of about 6.5 degrees Celsius, on average, although rising air could cool as fast as 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer. As the air parcel rises, pressure in the outside environment decreases, and the air parcel expands. This leads to the temperature of the air parcel dropping as well. To illustrate graphically, consider a typical saturation-specific humidity profile shown on the left and a typical environmental temperature profile on the right. Altitude goes up the y-axis. An air parcel is added to the environment with a relative humidity around 45% that is heated by radiation impacting the surface. The air parcel is depicted here with a circle on both plots so we can track its characteristics as it rises. Because the air parcel is warmer than its surrounding environment, it will rise. Specific humidity is conserved within the air parcel, meaning that its specific humidity doesn't change. However, its temperature decreases as it expands in the lower pressure environment. Thus, it moves to the left on the temperature plot. At around 3 kilometers altitude, the specific humidity of the air parcel now matches the saturation specific humidity. The air parcel is at 100% relative humidity and so condensation can now begin. This level is known as the lifting condensation level and will be the bottom of the cloud. The air parcel is still warmer than its environment at this point and so it continues to rise. Condensation is now occurring as the parcel rises. If it keeps the same specific humidity, it would then have a specific humidity larger than the saturation specific humidity, which is not allowed. Consequently, the extra moisture content condenses out so that the particle stays at 100% relative humidity for the remainder of its rise. Eventually, the temperature of the air parcel does match that of the surrounding environment. When this occurs at an altitude known as the neutral buoyancy level, the air parcel will stop rising. This is the cloud top. The cloud will thus stretch between roughly 3 km altitude and 10 km altitude in this example. Make sure to go over this example again to make sure you understand the processes under which this cloud development occurs. So what exactly causes air to rise? Here we see the different mechanisms that can cause lifting of the air. Convection is caused by heating of the air at a low level. When the air parcel becomes warmer than its surrounding environment, buoyancy causes it to rise, much like boiling water in a pot. The convective motion is offset by subsiding or sinking air around the convective plume. A typical horizontal scale for convection is around 5 kilometers. Another process that can cause lifting of air is topographic uplift. In this case, air that is blowing horizontally encounters a topographic barrier like a mountain. Unable to go around or under the mountain, the air is lifted over the barrier. Consequently, clouds and precipitation occur along the windward flank of the mountain where the lifting is occurring. This is a common process driving precipitation in California, particularly along the coastal ranges or the Sierra Nevadas. A typical horizontal scale for topographic uplift is around 150 kilometers. A third process that is common around the intertropical convergence zone is convergence of air. On the Earth, air that is drawn from the northern and southern hemispheres converges at the ITCZ. These colliding regions of air pile up in response, leading to rising motion. The typical scale of convergence is around 500 kilometers. The fourth process for lifting is associated with lifting of air along weather fronts. This particular process is a major driver of precipitation in the mid-latitudes, where mixing of cold northern air and warmer, moister southern air is common. In the case of frontal lifting, we must have a blob of cold air pushing into warm air, or a blob of warm air pushing into a blob of cold air. In this case, the warm air typically carries more moisture than the cold air, and because of its warmth, it is also more buoyant than the cold air, tending to rise above it. The differences in buoyancy where these two regions of air meet cause the warm, moist air to rise over the cold air. In both cases, the result is rising motion typically associated with precipitation. In the case of an approaching cold front, this steep nature of these fronts drive rapid uplift of air that can give rise to cumulonimbus towers. In the case of an approaching warm front, 
The slow rise of air over the cold air produces precipitating nimbostratus clouds. Once uplift occurs, cloud droplets will begin to form above the lifting condensation level. Note that there are vast size differences between a typical condensation nuclei, a cloud droplet, and a raindrop. Each are separated by a factor of around 100 in scale. Condensation nuclei are almost invisible to the human eye, being less than one one thousandth, one thousandth of a millimeter in size. A typical intermediate size cloud droplet is around 0.02 millimeters, and a typical raindrop is around 2 millimeters, although the largest raindrop ever measured was around 8 millimeters. As discussed earlier, the process of droplet formation is because of condensation of cool, moist air on cloud condensation nuclei. This occurs because the water vapor molecules are traveling sufficiently slowly to stick to the nuclei and to each other. Cloud droplets grow with time, as their growing size provides more surface area for molecules of water vapor from the environment to stick. The process is essentially the same as equilibrium conditions with a beaker of water. If the rate of condensation is greater than the rate of evaporation, then the droplet will grow. Under freezing conditions, the water may crystallize around the nuclei instead, producing water crystals that are precursors for snow. The growth rate of these droplets depends on the size of the droplet and the relative humidity of the environment. Under less moist environments, water droplets need to be larger to support growth. Very moist environments caused by rapid lifting can sustain smaller cloud droplets as well. Nonetheless, condensation is fairly rapid and works quickly to drive relative humidities back to 100%. Under certain conditions, liquid water droplets can exist even at temperatures below freezing. These droplets are known as supercooled droplets and are common in mid-level clouds such as alto cumulus. Precipitation of supercooled droplets also leads to freezing rain as they quickly freeze on contact with the ground. Droplets can grow not only through molecular effects, but also through collision with other droplets and subsequent mergers. Once the droplets become too large to be held aloft by uplift in the environment, these droplets will begin to fall. Falling droplets will sweep up smaller droplets that are captured in their wake, further building up the size of the droplet. Notably, the path taken by droplets and crystals in a cloud can be quite complicated as mergers and divisions occur. Typically, the stronger the updraft, the more time droplets are kept aloft, and so the more opportunity for those droplets to grow into larger droplets. Eventually, those larger droplets will overcome the strength of the updraft and precipitate out. The infographic shown here depicts the development of a deep convective storm. With sufficient surface warming, a convective plume is generated as air rises against the background environment. At the lifting condensation level, the cloud base forms and the turbulent motion within the clouds becomes obvious. Strong updrafts push the cloud higher and turbulence carries moisture to the sides. Raindrops precipitate out during the mature stage as the updrafts can no longer keep these larger droplets aloft. Eventually, when the updraft weakens, the storm begins to dissipate, precipitating out the moisture within the system. So, what does all this mean in light of climate change? Well, as we discussed last time, Higher water vapor concentrations in the atmosphere are associated with more cloud formation, as long as sufficient condensation nuclei are present. Consequently, the increased water vapor content can drive up the albedo of the planet and compensate for the warming effects of water vapor as a greenhouse gas. Nonetheless, clouds can also work to retain heat, as they also reflect outgoing terrestrial radiation back to the surface. Thus, there is large uncertainty in the effect that clouds have on the surface radiation budget. An analysis of satellite data have shown that clouds are reaching higher in the atmosphere than they have historically. However, there has been little observed change in the actual area of the planet's surface covered by clouds. Okay, that covers everything I want to talk about today, about clouds and precipitation. Precipitation has one obvious implication for society that we haven't touched on yet, namely, water resources. In the next lecture, we'll look at some of the implications of these changes in water availability in a changing climate.